Hey everyone, welcome to Somatic Fanatic, our very first long form episode right here on YouTube. We have some posts that are short little things I've done, but this is the format that the video podcast is really gonna settle into. Three hour plus episodes per week. Today's episode brought to you by Painworks. In fact, the next couple episodes are all gonna be by Painworks. And as you might imagine, we've got a theme here, reducing pain naturally through somatic arts, arts that train your nervous system to reduce pain without medication, without surgery, without dependence on anyone but your own inherent natural capabilities. We're going to teach you how to start down that road today. We're going to do three great things today. First thing we're going to do is I'm going to teach you some somatic fundamentals. Every episode we're going to talk about some basic issues about how to get the most out of your somatic training, your nervous system training. Then we're going to do something really fun called somatic reaction. I've got people suggesting videos and I'm gonna ask you for suggestions also during today's episode of videos of experts in all areas of nervous system training that I should check out. And I'm gonna watch them at the same time you're watching them. I'll hit pause, I'll make my comments, I'll say what I think. Uh, this will all be videos that I'm seeing for the very first time and you are too and we can learn something together from experts around the world. And then the most important part probably of our episode is our guest instructor. Today our guest instructor is Saul Anita from Norway. She is a pain reduction specialist, many decades of practice in teaching, and we're gonna hear her life story where she was brought to this work by very serious trauma in an accident, facing a situation perhaps you're familiar with of feeling hopeless and unable to overcome her pain until she found something very special out. I'll let her tell her story and that she has been very generous to provide an entire full length lesson that we can all do after the episode is over. All that and lots more, so let's get into it. Welcome to the episode, let's get started. Whether you are looking to reduce tension in your life, whether you're looking to sleep better, whether you're looking for higher performance in athletics, whether you're working to get rid of lower back pain or knee pain or all kinds of things, training your nervous system is a road to reducing excess uh, muscular tension that's hanging in throughout your entire system, organizing your movements better, and learning lots of tools to control your emotions quicker and easier, all through the magic of learning to feel more, to physically feel more. Today, I would like to tell you about a great tool that I use and many other people use in. Uh, our training to feel more, our kinesthetic sense. And this is a stick, a stick. I'm gonna show you some tips about how to use a stick to train your nervous system. So what kind of stick am I talking about? I'm talking about this the kind of dowel you can buy at a hardware store or Home Depot. Here's how thick mine is compared to my thumb, but you know, it doesn't really matter. This is a pretty thick stick. We use this for sort of martial arts training, it can bear a lot of weight, but you don't need a stick this thick for a lot of the stuff we're going to be talking about today. So I'm going to just walk over to the training area a little bit to my left and uh, show you how to use this stick. You can watch this again. Once you get a stick of your own, you can hit pause and, um, and uh, go get yourself a stick and then join along, rerun it, whatever you want. I also have a full length stick class absolutely free that you can get at Somatic Fanatic on YouTube. There's a, a link and you can get access to this whole thing uh, that shows you a lot of tricks about the stick. We're gonna go into the fundamentals. Let's check it out over at the training area here at Elk River Studios in Brewer, Maine. So a stick, a stick, a stick. What can a stick do for us when it comes to nervous system training? A stick is great for a couple of reasons, and we're gonna go into a few of them today. Just a little brief primer on stick uh, work for somatics. 
So one thing you can do is a, a stick can, um, huh, it does a few things. It acts as an aid to extend your limbs and extending your limbs can show you a few things. It can show you um, directions that your bones can go in that, are, that feel more and less efficient. Um, one of the things we're going to do today is we're going to, in a few minutes, we're going to move the stick around while we're pushing in toward the center. Then we're going to move around while we're pulling out uh, away. We're going to keep our hands uh, still, but with, with pressure either in or pressure out, and we're going to move around and, and you'll see that you'll feel things in your shoulders, um, in your shoulder carriage and in your ribs that you wouldn't feel otherwise. The other thing a stick can really do is it can teach us about waves, about uh, waves of, of motion that are happening. Anytime that we're using our arm, we, we can just mechanically uh, force a motion with all of our muscles, or we can generate a motion. We can keep our, our arm or our leg loose and take advantage of this natural wave of energy that, uh, like in a rope, or a whip is going through the arm. I'm, I'm just moving my, if I keep my arm totally loose and I'm just gonna use, I'll get set up. So I'm just kind of what, I'm, I'm uh, twisting at the hips and I'm just gonna let my arm hang like a rope. And you see that there's this wave of effort going through. This is happening even in more subtle movements, but a stick because of this leverage lets us see the natural conclusion of this wave-like motion and can teach us all kinds of things about letting that wave travel and accommodating that wave. Look, as, as, as I'm bringing the wave more toward the center, I have to accommodate that wave by making another wave through my body. There's all kinds of stuff you can learn from a stick. So I'm going to imagine for a moment that you've hit pause and you've gotten a stick. Why don't you do a few things with me? Now, the first thing I'd like to do is what I started describing. And I would like us to hold our stick. We can just hold it down. And like everything in somatics, everything I'm telling you to do is a suggestion. You do what's comfortable for you. You never want to feel discomfort when you're training your nervous system, at least in the style we are right now, what they call the parasympathetic side of nervous system function. That is a big fancy word meaning relaxed. We are relaxed today as we're using the stick, okay? This episode of uh, Somatic Fanatic, if you're watching this training on Somatic Fanatic, is brought to you by PainWorks. And so we're really going to pay attention assuming that you might be in some pain, maybe in your shoulders, maybe a torn rotator cuff. So again, no matter what I do, you do what's comfortable for you, okay? So let's start with exactly what I described before. Actually, before we even start that, let's get a sense for having a light relationship with our stick. Just toss it a little bit out of your hands, and I don't know what kind of stick you've got, but um, let me put it on your shoulder and very gently rub the stick on your head very gently very gently a stick can look intimidating to some people and one way to get a friendlier relationship with the stick or anything is to massage yourself with it in my last youtube channel show emergency fish party there's an episode where we are in toronto uh maybe we'll run that uh soon on Somatic Fanatic, where we are training with uh, great instructor Yuri Olin about fear of falling down the stairs and fear of stairs in general. They're so jagged. People can imagine getting very seriously hurt by falling down the stairs. And what did Yuri tell us in that episode? He said, anything that you're scared of, massage yourself with it. It will change your whole attitude toward this thing. So if the stick intimidates you in any way, Rub it up and down your body. I've got the microphone on, so I'm not going to you know, make a whole bunch of noise for you. But you can rub the stick up and down until it feels light. It feels friendly to you. It feels like your friend. 
We're not going to do it today, but ultimately you can do all kinds of exercises to keep your relationship with the stick very, very light. And here I'm tossing it up and it's almost silent as it comes into my hand because I'm moving with it. This is a little bit beyond what we're going to do today, but stay tuned because we're going to get into all kinds of that stuff. So now that we're comfortable with our stick, maybe hold it up a little bit, rest anytime you want. What we're going to do is we're going to apply pressure inward. I'm going to grip the stick so my hands don't move, but I'm going to start pressing both my hands toward each other. You don't have to do this a lot. This isn't a strength building exercise, but we just put some tension on. Just feel, where is that work happening? I'm a wiggler, everybody. So you're going to see me wiggling, moving. I'm trying to remind all the parts of my body to relax by just this light exploration of wiggling. Now let's move the stick down. We're still, this entire time, we're going to be pressing inward, right? We don't let that pressure, it doesn't have to be a lot of pressure, but just keep that pressure constant. Feel any difference in how does that work move? The work we have to do to keep our hands pressing toward each other. How does that, does that change at all as we bring the stick up now? And you feel different muscles taking over the work as the hands come up and down, or does it stay the same? What about if I bring the stick slightly back? I'm still pressing in. I'm still pressing toward the center. Does that change the muscles involved? What if I bring it away from myself now? Is that changing the muscles involved in pushing it that way toward the center? And down, away from me now. I feel muscles changing. I, I feel different muscle groups doing the work. Do it again and just but rest for a second. Stop that inward pressure. And don't do the inward pressure much. We're just trying to learn the connection of the work. Now let's press in again. Start bringing it up again very, very slowly. We always want to move in slow motion. We always want to, I'm moving my shoulders back and forth. I'm pressing in toward the center. But I'm rolling my shoulders. I'm trying to remind myself that even though a lot of the work is happening here, how can I not have the work being done too much by one specific muscle? How can I move the sense of work around so there's this even sense of effort in this whole, I guess I'm making sort of like a, a circle. You see? See the circle of effort because I'm pushing in? How can I move that effort kind of equally around even though the stick's moving? As the stick moves, the, the angles are totally changing. The muscles involved, some of them are the same. Some of them have to change. So now let's do something else. And again, if you have to rest, rest and then come back with us anytime you want. I call it jumping on and off the bus. We're going to kind of keep the bus moving. Anytime you need to jump off the bus, you jump off the bus, you rest, jump back on the bus whenever you want. Okay, so we're up here. We're still pressing in now. Now let's try another direction and see what happens. Let's do a, a, a very slowly a circle this way, okay? We're gonna go like that. But we're gonna do it very slowly with a little bit of pressure still toward the center and we wanna, now that feels a lot different to me. Feel the difference in how that work has to get executed now when we're so asymmetrical. One one hand toward the center, the other one way out to the side. Before we were doing sort of symmetrical work as we were coming before and after, you know, the arms were equidistant from the center of our body. So it was very much the same on either side. Now we're changing that relationship. So how does this work of pushing both hands toward the center have to change as we do this asymmetrical pattern? And we're not trying to improve strength. We're just trying to feel how this work is getting executed, okay? So feel, 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 feel. I'm gonna go the other direction very slowly. I don't wanna move fast because I wanna notice as the organization of this work is changing. And for me, I'm gonna keep trying to relax as much as I can. I'm gonna keep breathing, everybody. I'm forgetting to tell you to breathe, but uh, breathe. 
I'm 56 years old. I've been breathing for 56 years so far. I highly recommend breathing. Great thing to do every day. Okay, so let's rest for a second. So this you can play around endlessly. You can push the stick in and you can, I'm pushing it toward the center. Don't do this, but just look, I can, I'm pushing toward the center. I can, I can do twists. I can reach out there. I can reach down. I can do all kinds of stuff with this inward pressure on the stick. Okay. So somebody take a, a wild guess what we're going to do next. Just think what could we possibly be doing? We're going to start in the same position, just like this. <gasps> yes, you got it. Now we're going to pull slightly away. Hold the hands tight enough so they don't move, but we're going to apply pressure out from the center toward both ends. And let's see how that's different. Let's do the first thing we did before. Let's reach down. Now we're pulling out from center. You can already tell, I think, that there's very different muscles at work now than the first time around. And again, we're not breaking a sweat. We're not shaking. We're not testing anywhere near the limits of our strength. It's not about strength. It's about feeling the connective tissue and how this work is changing as we change the position of the stick. The simple work of pulling my hands away from each other on the stick. And as the stick position changes, ooh. Wow, I feel even more changes up and down pulling out than I did pulling in. And coming back down, I'm still close to the body, just basically imitating what we did before, but now where the pull is going to the outside. Great. And now let's do that circle where it goes away from the body. Let's come up close to the body. Again, we're feeling it. Feel it in your ribs. Feel what's happening in your pelvis even. All up and down the arms, through your chest. What's doing the work? What's changing? Now let's come out and away. Now we did this before, we're out and away from the body while we're up. What's having to change now for this slight outward pulling? Just enough to feel it. Oh, we're near our max, yeah? Nice and easy and never ending. Go the other way. Feel what's happening in the back. Between and under the shoulder blades. And what's happening, wow, as we come up this way. Oh boy, that work changed. See how I'm wiggling my shoulder blades and I'm just trying to remind myself to not get bound up. I have a tendency where a lot of the work winds up going here. I think some people can relate to that. For me, sort of keeping those shoulders moving helps me spread that work away from this one little spot and, and more equally distribute this work, which is what we're after. The more you, if you feel yourself getting bound up somewhere, wiggle it a little bit. If you feel tension in your neck, give it a little, and not a forced, thing, but just within a small range of your motion, nowhere near range of your motion. So we're pulling out. Let's try another thing we haven't tried yet. Let's try tilting. Oh, <laughs> the stick's not in the camera, but imagine my hands are up. Try tilting one end of the stick. I'll kneel down. And then back to this, all the way to this. What's changing in this work? Now we're asymmetrical. Remember before we were asymmetrical this way? Now we're asymmetrical this way. My hand is over my head. This one's way out in the front. Different thing here. The stick's in the shot. Nice. So now we've got an asymmetrical pattern, but over our heads. Feeling the changes, feeling the differences. This is what uh, improves the, the function of your nervous system. Noticing difference. That's how your nervous system works by feeling. This is just a simple little demonstration of this world of training open to you by using a stick to feel more. This is just, we did one exercise, two variations. I showed you how to play with it. There's many more things you can do with a stick. 
and happy to show those to you at another time. I'm gonna head back over to the other spot here. This episode of Somatic Fanatic, of course, brought to you by Painworks, our episode today, really focusing on people in pain. And uh, I had a video suggested to me to react to. This is someone I have not heard before, uh, Ms. Dana Sterling. I've heard of her. And her approach to, um, what would you say, um, fascia, and the mystery of chronic pain is the, the name of her talk. I have not heard this talk before. Uh, I am happy to react to any videos. And I want to remind you guys in the comments on this episode, please suggest to me uh, any videos you know of that are about an interesting training discipline, uh, something about the discipline you're involved in that really illustrates the principles of it, anything that you've seen that you're excited about, about nervous system training, about fascia and uh, connective tissue, and all the things that we're involved with here, chronic pain, um, uh, techniques that don't involve medications or surgery, but are natural remedies, uh, again, and I don't mean herbal, but I mean through movement or touch, anything that excites you, send us the links in the comments. My staff's going to put it on the list, and sooner or later, I will wind up reacting to these videos with you. It's a way for me to learn things I've never heard of and to share it with you at the same time. I cannot watch it all the way through because of copyright, so I will be interrupting. I, I hope this adds to the experience and doesn't take away from the experience. I have no idea uh, what Dana Sterling is about to teach us about fascia and the mystery of chronic pain, but I sure know that it is going to be interesting. Well, I'm going to maximize my screen for her, so I have totally uninterrupted attention. And without further ado, Dana Sterling from Life Talk. At Sterling Structural Therapy, we use a, an innovative, completely non-invasive approach to the treatment of orthopedic and chronic pain conditions. And one of the things that makes this method unique, one of the factors, is that it is a fascia-based approach. Another word for fascia is, another term for it is connective tissue. Today, I'm going to tell you give you a brief synopsis of what is this fascia thing that you might have already been hearing about a little bit in the media. I'm also going to give you a very clear, concrete, visual demonstration of how fascia is affecting every single one of you right now just sitting here, and also when you're on the golf course, at the gym, or even if you're just trying to put your uh, bag in the overhead bin on the airplane. So whenever we introduce a new concept, and fascia is a brand new concept in medicine and rehabilitation. It's only about seven to 10 years old, the research on this. It's really important that we actually connect it to what we already know to get a better understanding. So let's start with two anatomical systems we're all really, really familiar with. So the first system, we all have seen this at one point or another, the skeletal system, and if you need to tune up to your skeletal system, you book an appointment with Dr. Rob. And then the next anatomical system, again, I doubt there's anyone in the room that doesn't know it or won't recognize it, the muscular system. And for tune-ups on this system, you go see our friends at the exercise coach and go get some testing done in Cerulean to figure out what exactly to do with this. Now, this is sometimes, those two systems will sometimes be called the musculoskeletal system. I'm about to tell you about a third system, a massive one, that actually connects those two to each other. And this system has been summarily ignored in rehabilitation and medicine actually for hundreds of years. So how it's been ignored is that the way we study anatomy to understand how to better help people recover is through cadaver dissection. And for hundreds of years, when we are doing cadaver dissection, we have simply been cutting away this fascia connective tissue and literally throwing it in the garbage bin. Let that sink in for a second. We're living in a time right now in the early 2020s of this great debate 
between science and the learned ones and the ones who should not be questioned in any way. And yet she's saying that for, for all the, how many years of study do you think is cumulative between the millions of physicians on the planet? Hundreds of millions of years of, of study cumulatively. And yet for hundreds of years, this major system in the body was being cut away and discarded and disregarded. Medicine is miraculous. Medicine and surgery have enabled us to extend our lives in all kinds of things, and yet every culture has things it pays attention to and things it doesn't pay attention to. And the medical culture has all but ignored fascia. Did you hear what she said seven to ten years ago? How long have doctors been getting educated? And all this time there's this major system in the body that was completely ignored. And you want to know what else is completely ignored by the medical community? The, the toll on wellness that chronic tension in your soft tissues causes to health. Completely not seen. We have to remember that for all the advancements, medicine is generally in a mindset of chemical solutions or cutting solutions to whatever problem it is that, that they're addressing. They are chemists and they are cutters. Things that have to do with natural processes of wellness like training your nervous system, coaxing your nervous system to let go habitual tension, to ease up on the joints, to ease up on the inflammation caused by this, to, to get rid of your supplementations in your spine by relaxing your back and relaxing the, the deep front um, layer of fascia that are chronically shortening on the front of your spine, chronically shortening on the back of your spine, putting all that pressure. A lot of chiropractors want to tell you that gravity is what's causing your supplementation. Well, I've got gravity too, and I'm not supplemented. Same gravity hitting me is hitting you. It's got to be something other than gravity at play. Now, some people have back problems from impact, from injuries, but some people, it, it, their back just starts hurting. Wow, and it's hurting more and it's hurting more. So I just want to interrupt and, and let this sink in that, um, that what Ms. Sterling is saying to us is so important to remember. We are surrounded by experts who really are experts. There's no question medical doctors are experts. No question about it. But they are experts within a culture of a certain vantage point. They want empirical evidence. Empirical evidence. What can you measure in a test tube? What can you put on a chart and measure? First it was 7, now it's 7.5, then it was 8.2. That's what they value. Everything that we're talking about, nervous system training, the machines to measure nervous system improvement are only just now. We're in a moment where these machines to measure this are, are at the beginning of their effectiveness. Nervous system training has always been considered an anecdotal evidence bunch of disciplines and therefore lesser than empirical evidence disciplines of medicine and science and whatever. But I would argue that it's not a case that you cannot measure the improvement of a higher performing nervous system. The case has been that until recently the tools to measure this did not exist. It doesn't mean it was not measurable. It meant the tools to measure improvement of nervous system function did not exist until very recently, and they're still very much in their infancy for all the advancements. So I just want to interrupt Dana. I'm going to back up to, so, so we don't miss a word she has to say, but what she just said there to me is so close to my heart in just reminding everybody that when they say trust the science, while keeping in mind that scientists are operating within a, a scientific culture, that focuses on certain things and discounts other things, even if they're real. You have fascia in your body. The fact that the medical um, study cultures chose to ignore it doesn't make it any less real. Let's go back. Active tissue. 
and literally throwing it in the garbage bin. So when I went to college, which was not hundreds of years ago, but a little while ago, um, same thing. We were just taught to cut it away so you can look and study the muscle and look and study the bone, look at the attachment and origin. We were actually taught that fascia is simply packing material. And we're not an Amazon package. <laughs> Okay, we are brilliantly designed. Everything in there is for a reason. What we're finding out, like those two blue diagrams that you see behind me, not only does fascia matter, but it has very specific lines of pull. And if you could look at those two diagrams, can you imagine if someone has a fascia restriction through this that will alter their muscles and their bone positions, that they, their posture might change, and then their range of motion, and maybe they'll develop some issues based on this. Now, the image in the center is very useful because I want you to think as your fascia, as your birthday suit. <laughs> it's the organ of form. And those two images on the side is actually fascia when magnified times 25. It looks like cobwebs. So it's literally the cobwebs that make you who you are. Now, Fascia is an interesting thing. Another reason that it's been summarily ignored, even in modern-day medicine, is guess what? Fascia does not show up in MRIs, X-rays, or CT scans. So imagine someone's having an issue, and they're getting some imaging done, and I'm not going to argue that their images are showing possible stenosis, bone-on-bone, -bone, et cetera. That is true, but there's another big piece of the puzzle that's simply being ignored, can you imagine getting a diagnosis and treatment based on seriously incomplete data? That, it does not sound like a good equation, does it? And yet that's the equation we all face and have faced all along, right till this very minute. We are getting diagnoses for many things having to do with muscular problems, um, uh, problems of range of motion, problems of pain uh, brought on by chronic tension and inflammation caused by this chronic tension, by all kinds of uh, deformities, by uh, sclerosis of different kinds, with machines that cannot see this major system. Major system. Tom Myers, um, one of my heroes, he says in one of his videos that if you were to... Um, be able to chemically melt away the um, nervous system. Poor chemicals and all the nervous system would leave. You would still see what would look like an essentially whole body because the nervous system is enmeshed with the muscles, enmeshed with the fascia. If you were, on the other hand, to chemically melt away all the muscle cells in the body, you would see an entire whole body body because the fascia would still be there, the nerves would be there, and again, it, and now if you melt the fascia away, you know what would happen? All those little muscle cells would just fall to the ground like liquid. They do not have the ability to attach to each other. Muscle cells are actually trapped within the fascia, and as they shorten, it's the fascia that pulls, and it's the fascia that does the work based on all these muscle cells being individually operating and nested in this web of fascia. The fascia is the web that the muscle cells pull on, and the fascia is what makes the actual work happen. And yet there's not a single machine that you can go to that's going to show you that fascia system. Wowie, wowie, wow. And we wonder why diagnoses are not always 100% accurate. Why sometimes it's a lot easier for the doctor to tell us what's wrong than to give us a solution for it, especially a solution that is not based on chemicals or surgery. This is a real tall order. Let's go back. Incomplete data. That, it does not sound like a good equation, does it? Now, some other fun fascia facts. Fascia has six to 10 times more sensory nerves than muscle. If you've ever had really, really bad muscle soreness after a serious workout, I mean, the next two days, you're kind of walking funny. This is some pretty high-level pain, right? But the good news is, A, that's actually healthy. It's adaptation, and it goes away. Can you imagine that pain magnified times six or ten times? 
and how about it doesn't go away, hence chronic. And if anyone in this room has ever had their back go out on them, their knee buckle, their neck go out on them, you know exactly what kind of pain I'm talking about. And some people that we work with, they're walking in, how long has this been going on? Three months, six months, a year, three years, and very often and sadly so, two decades, three decades, oh, let me think about it. So the good news is that fascia can give people like that a way out. And right now, I'm going to give you that visual demonstration that I promised in order to make sense of all of this so you can understand how it's affecting you right now. So allow me to introduce my colleague, Cody Williams, who is a structural therapist at Sterling Structural Therapy. But today, good, please giggle and whistle for the love of, yes, good. For today, Cody is Monsieur Fascia, okay? And I'm going to torture him and give him all sorts of fascia restrictions. Uh, now, before I do, Cody's fascia suit is healthy. And notice the cobwebs, right? They're doing well, right? So he can lift his arms, he can move, he can go hike. Um, he can go play tennis, he can, do it, he can tie his shoes, no pain, okay? No problem. I'm about to change that. So I'm gonna give Cody a myofascia restriction at his right rib cage and armpit. And if you could already see, he's already having to adapt a little bit against this. Good. So now, Cody, go ahead and try to lift both arms up for me. And we're going to just, woo, good. Okay. So can you see that his range of motion is restricted, restricted right now? Really try to lift them up higher, Cody. Okay. Now, drop them back down because, ow, that's not fun. Now, this makes sense, right? You can imagine how this is going to create this restriction. Did you notice what happened at his left shoulder over here? Uh-huh, yeah? So go ahead, lift both of them again. A fascial restriction here is causing some serious range of motion issues over here. Now let's drop that down, and I'm going to give him a fascial release and fix him up, and now, woohoo, yeah. Did you notice him kind of move his neck? That can, is not comfortable in the neck either. Just going to give you a brief example, a client that came to see us, fully torn rotator cuff. The surgeon said, sorry, can't repair it, fully torn. She now has that full range of motion and no more pain because we actually helped her modify her fascial restriction and she changed certain habits to not recreate it. So it's actually incredibly adaptive. Okay? Your body is incredibly adaptive. It does not rely on just one small little muscle and there are even four little rotator cuff muscles if you create balance elsewhere. I'm going to give another example, torture Cody some more. And this is a bit more of a complex example. So I'm going to give Cody a pretty severe myofascial restriction at his right hip. Good. Now, first of all, can you see how Cody has started to kind of develop some interesting posture? Good. Cody, try to lift your arms for me, please. See where the restriction is? It's even worse than before, by the way. Did you notice that? and then drop the arms back down. Now, Cody's gonna attempt to walk with this myofascial restriction, so we're gonna go for a little walk, and he's gonna walk a little bit interestingly, right? Okay, and we're gonna back it up so we don't fall on Dr. Rob. Good, okay? So, what I want you to see is that, first of all, you already saw how this affects his shoulders, think about his neck. Can you imagine what might be happening at this hip over here? How that might be compensating and actually wearing on things, maybe even wearing cartilage from the position? Of course, this hip is probably not very happy, and this knee could have serious problems. With this pattern, Cody can have plantar fasciitis on his left foot because it has to deal with severe loads and modified impact with every step to try to stabilize him. This is the interesting thing with fascia. Where you think it is, it ain't, okay? And the other point is, can you imagine his lumbar spine? I dare anyone to go for a walk with this. Half an hour. Tell me how your back feels. Okay, so I'll set Cody free, proverbially and literally. Thank you, Cody. Everybody, please give him a hand for being tortured. Okay. One thing I just want to jump in with is when um, Dana is talking about fascial restrictions. Sometimes fascial restrictions are because something hasn't moved in a, in a long time and a fascia is actually extruded. It's sort of like squeezed out of specialized cells, uh, kind of like toothpaste. And when we're moving a lot, it um, extrudes in a pattern that's very much like a fishnet. 
But when we are not moving so much, when it's not under strain, it squirts out more like velvet and can sort of get tangled up on itself. So there's that kind of fascial restriction where uh, there's a lot of uh, fascia being extruded without a real purpose and um, it, it builds up on itself and, and causes a, a, a restriction. But a lot of times, fascia restriction is because there are chronic habituated commands of tension in the muscle cells that are embedded within that fascia. And the muscle cells stay shortened and a thing called sensory motor amnesia kicks in. The nervous system forgets its ability to release those muscles and elongate that fascia. And over time, that fascia becomes foreshortened. It's extruded in this shorter form because the muscles have been in this shortened form and it's extruding, extruding, extruding. And now it literally is shorter. Even if the muscles were to release, that fascia cannot stretch its full amount because it's been contracted for so long. So I just wanted to uh, overview the very broad strokes of why fascial restrictions can occur. Let's go back. And now I'm gonna give you that real life example. It's actually my privilege to share the story of one of our amazing, courageous clients and their journey to recovery. Samantha's story. By the time Samantha came to see us, these are the surgical procedures that she had gone through. It started out with double scopes on each knee. Didn't work. They did a release of the ligaments on the outside of her knees. A Couple of years later, she ended up with low back pain. They did lumbar spine surgery, a discectomy. A Couple years later, Samantha ended up with severe debilitating neck pain. I'm seeing some faces that, yeah, it's not pretty, yeah? Okay, and what they did this time is they put this hardware in her neck. Okay, so they did an, uh, just trying to help her, yes? They did an anterior cervical fusion. They fused her neck. So by the time she was sitting in front of us, she was literally immobile. She was pale gray, could be very shallow breathing, uh, could not do any of the things she loved to do, and relied on opiates daily simply to cope. And I like this example because if anyone should be like a, an end game, it's Samantha, right? Like this is it, like okay, uh, let's change the meds maybe, find different ways of coping with this. Well, I'm here to tell you that's not what happened. That's Samantha today. That is a year and eight months after starting treatment. Through a heck of a lot of diligent work, investment in herself, time, money, energy, and she still does daily homework exercises, absolutely necessary to sustain and actually to increase the trajectory of her uh, mobility, yes? She's back today to national level competitive horse training. The point of my story is, if anyone tells you it's too late, and you even have the MRIs and x-rays that say so, don't believe it. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you, Dana. I couldn't have said it better myself. No matter what someone tells you, she said it earlier, your body presents you with so many choices. You don't just have one muscle to do my, what I always do, the raising of the arm, you know, because it's in the, on camera, I can easily raise the arm. You don't just have one choice of how to raise your arm. There's thousands of strands of muscles. There's lots of parts of the body that can contribute to getting this arm up in all kinds of ways. Maybe here, and maybe I did, and then and I do this or whatever. There's choices, there are choices. And your nervous system is designed to find options for you, but you have to train it. You have to train, you have to feel this connective tissue, you have to feel more and more and more. I know for people watching today who've been in pain, who have been down this road of being told that only surgery will help, only medication will temporarily help, painkillers, muscle relaxers. If you've been in this situation, 
if you have faced serious pain from injury or just maybe it comes on, write in the comments right now. Write in the comments, tell us what's the kind of, what's your story? Where were you when you were confronted with this dismal array of choices of surgery, hardware being put in you, um, the, the, uh, the mild version of it with its, your back hurts, strengthen your core. I, 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 if I could put a stop to this advice in the world, this would be my number one mission. If your back hurts, if your neck hurts, your fascia is seized more than likely. And unless you've been in an accident and you know that, but if it just kind of starts hurting from sitting in a desk too long, from doing a immobile lifestyle, from lots of emotional problems, and now your back hurts, whatever the reason is, this pain is in part happening to you because you have chronic tension in your muscles, it's shortening your fascia, it's putting pressure on all your joints, it's raising your blood pressure, it's doing all kinds of stuff. Moving for the purpose of feeling, training your nervous system, starting to feel this connective tissue and how it affects each other, uh, realizing that we have lots and lots of um, options lots and lots of choices, and we can discover more easeful movement, not through a pill, not through a liquid, not through a chemical, not through a supplement, not through somebody's knife, but by moving and being touched for the purpose of feeling more, feeling more. If you're in pain, it sounds scary, but I'm telling you, this is the way out of pain, under your own power, under your own natural power, and I applaud uh, Dana Sterling, uh, her life talk, her um, optimal health movement, it all sounds like they're exactly on the same path that we are celebrating here on Somatic Fanatic. Thanks for watching our video, and let's move on to the next part of the show. So now we are going to go to a real exciting part of this week's episode brought to you by PainWorks. We're going to head toward some live free training, an entire class of free training for you, absolutely free to help reduce your pain. Before we get to the training, I am going to introduce you to uh, an instructor I've been really excited about meeting for the first time. She is based out of Norway, the only instructor so far that I've met from Norway. Very uh, interested in meeting uh, Sol. So good of you to join us on Somatic Fanatic. How are you today? Thank you so much for inviting me, Dan. I'm fine, thank you. I'm so happy to be here. So tell us something about your practice. Who do you normally train with? Uh, do you train live? Do you train online? Do you train in English? Do you um, train in Norwegian? What's your daily life like as a somatics trainer? So right now, after the COVID hit, I had to close down my clinic. So now I only teach online. And I have clients one-to-one teaching uh, them movements for pain relief uh, combined with therapy through, you know, working with people in chronic muscle pain and also emotional pain. And I also have uh, regular dropping classes where people can come uh, every week to, uh, to join a class live. Mm -hmm. And then I also have uh, my own teacher training for new uh, teachers in somatics so that they can learn others to come out of pain. And this fall, I'm going to launch a group that I call Out of Pain, which also is an online program for people struggling with pain, but who wants to work together um, with each other in a group. So this is what I've been doing now for the last one and a half years. And uh, this is what I love. Well, this is really exciting to hear in the sense that so many somatics instructors, their world upside down, like so many of us during COVID and for somatics instructors and for people who were lucky enough to know that uh, online somatic training has been available. It's been part, it's been one blessing among uh, about a year and a half where blessings were few and far between. Um, how, 
has teaching online changed in your mind from when you first had to do it because it was a desperate situation? Were there any surprises in the last year in teaching on Zoom? Was there any value and, and, and benefit to that type of training that you weren't expecting when you started? Yeah, first of all, just answer the question you asked me earlier. I only teach in Nor Norwegian, but at this home lab, I'm going to teach in English. So this is amazing. Um, and I've been in England as a assistant teacher with essential somatics and also doing some gentle somatic yoga in England. So the question about if there were any surprises by going online instead of physically meetings, you know, what I see working one-to-one -one is actually that the transformation is even bigger for the client because now I can do long-term programs with them that I created for, for online. And it seems like the, the clients are actually more dedicated to their process. And also the, the teacher training I'm doing, which is you know now online instead of um, uh, meeting physically, mm -hmm. uh, we have created uh, bodies where they connect after the, the, the online meetings, they're actually meeting online between the, the, um, the meetings we have. And it seems like this is building a new community. So I really love working online. It is building communities and, um, it seems like it's easier to dedicate um, now as we're online, actually, than when we just met physically. So mm. this is a surprise, actually. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it makes me wonder if maybe being in the comfort of their own home and needing to feel safe for somatic education is kind of making it not just easier for them to show up because they're already home, but th th there's something about associating it with the safety of being home that, that maybe is making people more enthusiastic. The, uh, I've met so many instructors in the last six months who have been saying the same thing, how surprising it was that especially this new form of training where people used to do not group, but come in and be touched by a practitioner. Now that that hasn't been uh, feasible this past year, a lot of touch practitioners have been doing this one-on-one -on -one online uh and of course i think everybody was a little skeptical the first one or two times they tried it but were amazed at how right away uh people took to it in in, in a in a very surprisingly passionate kind of reaction and also that people across the country can join instead of just a few in the local you know area so this is also very positive um, and um, and it's easier also to 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 share my story um, uh, and get this this feel or this method out in in Norway because I try to to deliver what I've lived and um, through my life experiences and uh, to go online and go live on um, Facebook and and do the the work you know being visible. Uh, it's really it's really interesting to see how it's slowly but surely spreading spreading out how did you before you decided to do it as a vocation and help others how did somatics enter your life for for personal benefit so this is actually a story um i was uh, in my last pregnancy my nervous system actually broke down and i got really really ill and sick and um when I was giving birth, I had chronic fatigue. And six weeks after the birth, I was pushing myself to start training again and going uh, to the gym. And one day I was bringing my baby and he was six, week, uh, six weeks old and we were in the car and I was gonna post a letter on the way. And I parked the car and I go to post the letter. And as I post the letter, I can sense something coming behind me. And when I turn, to look is the car running towards me. So I actually was squeezed between the car and a wall and I broke my pelvis in the front and back and my back. So I was sitting in a wheelchair with four children. I couldn't move and I um, didn't have any energy to anything. So uh, because I've been pushing myself and I was, you know, taking my decision through, you know, my will, not from what my body said. 
So, and from there I was on the coach and I was in the wheelchair. And after some time, since the doctors couldn't help me and the physios and the, um, well, all the doctors I was um, visiting, they said there were nothing they could do for me. And that was really uh, painful. And I figured out if no one can do anything with me, I can do something for myself. And then I started to do research up there. And then I found the somatics by coincidence. And at that time I started barely to teach again in uh, belly dance because I was a belly dance teacher. And then I brought the, some movements as I found on YouTube into the class of belly dance and it was pure somatics. And they said, today you saved my life. One of the students said, today you, you saved my life. And I said, what was happening? When we did these movements, something shifted inside me and I could feel that the anxiety was relieving, you know, and I felt so calm. And suddenly, you know, people coming to the classes, they could explain the same experiences. So I had to do some research for the somatics. And then I got in contact with my teacher, Martha Peterson. And I actually uh, was traveling to England for three years to do this education. And I thought I was signed up for um, teacher training, doing movements, and then it was the clinical work. So this is how I came over it. Uh, by being in this accident, sitting in a wheelchair, no help from others, I had to fix myself. And it took me, many, many, many years of education, learning about the nervous system, practicing different fields and methods and living it. Uh, and when I had done the somatics, this was the missing link for me. I really fell in love with the method because this is what got me my energy back and I was getting free from pain. I could move freely again. And I was thinking, well, if I can do this for me, uh, someone else will have benefit from this. And then I started to offer classes and um, uh, people were just thrilled about this work and now after nine years this is what I do this is what I live um, this is what I practice and this is what I teach and educate uh, educate others so it's really really uh, a love story of somatics <laughs> from actually an accident where I was lucky to go yeah, much like Moshe Feldenkrais himself and, and many people, the, these, these major injuries, catastrophic injuries are what slow us down and open us up to um, a different way. Of course, if you need surgery, you must get surgery. If you need pen medications, you must uh, get pain medications. But um, nature uh, provides you with a natural way of at least relaxing and organizing your movements and to one degree or another whatever the source of your pain is in most cases if you can have your nervous system relax the soft tissues it puts so much less strain on your system than even if it's from a broken leg or a pinched nerve or whatever it is if you are like this all those problems are being exacerbated all day every day even when you're asleep if you were to like hit the the third rail on the on the on the the subway on the on the underground and passed out from getting shocked your entire body would just relax but when you're asleep it doesn't do that your neck is still engaged your muscles are still engaged and this is the missing part of the medical discussion in the medical world the wear and tear that excess tonus as they say in the feldenkrais method i call it chronic tension um, if your muscle musculature is just tense all the time it is causing tremendous damage tremendous overwork it's increasing your blood pressure it's in it's exacerbating arthritic conditions it's doing all kinds of stuff and no doctors are trained in this they, they are not cognizant of the state of soft tissues in any way and um for those of us who are um it's it's frustrating what are the kinds of things that people who come to you, let, let's talk a couple of things. When, when people come to you, um, what are the classic examples of what's going on in their life? What are the classic examples of, I'm sure most people have tried a lot of other things before they walk through your door. So what, what, is the, what are the other stories that you've been familiar with of people that are curious enough to give you a call and say, can I come train? Um, 
it seems like I attract people who have experienced similar situations like I have done, uh, serious accidents, uh, burnout, fatigue, um, trauma, lots of trauma, especially from the childhood. And these are the kinds of people that I am attracting really uh, with emotional pain and physically pain. And they've tried most of whatever is out there, but mostly modalities where people have been doing something on them or with them or to them. Uh, and if they've done something for themselves, it's been heart training or stretching. So when I teach them to reprogram their nervous system and how their brain is controlling their movements and muscles, um, they get a taste of how little they need to do before the transformation is happening uh, because the movements are, are so gentle and it's because they're working with the brain, the conscious part of the brain and the muscles and the nervous system all together. So they're getting back their energy, they sleep better, they function better. Um, it's really important for me to give them education and have a fund um, how can I say, a foundation of, of knowledge and, and education on board together with the teaching of the movements. So, and they all say that it's like coming home to their body. Why haven't anyone told me this before? So mostly it's chronic muscle pain and stiffness, chronic fatigue and trauma. And then I have created this program where I include um, both um, emotional work, somatics with movements, and also um, the, looking at the mindset. So it's, um, yeah, it's mostly fatigue and pain. Yeah. I think um, all of us separate pain between physical pain and emotional pain, but the nervous system doesn't seem to differentiate pain as clearly. Why don't you talk a little bit about how we all think of these two types of pain versus how the nervous system uh, feels those pains and deals with those pains? So we know that emotional pain and physically pain and whatever pain, it's sensations. So it signals coming from the body up to the brain and the brain has to figure out what is this. Um, we also know that we have um, an emotional part of the brain with, which is creating the emotions, but we feel them in our bodies, mostly from our throat in the chest, belly and down to the pelvis. So it's on the front side, we have the emotions and feelings. They have the seat in the front uh, and it could be like sadness, grief, anger, fear, anxiety, and all these feelings and emotions uh, can be painful to feel. And if they don't allow themselves to feel the emotions, they try to lock them down, not even um, look at them, this will create tension in the bodies. And um, you know, unfelt feelings will also create pain. So it, it's sensations really. Muscle pain comes because there is tight muscle, chronic tight and short muscles, and there is fatigue in the muscles and also lots of acid due to the tightness. Um, so this can be the muscle pain. And of course, we also have uh, inflammation, uh, which also is, is another kind of pain I mostly work with chronic muscle pain mm -hmm. uh, because that is um, created in the brain as well. The brain is creating pain signals sending down to the body, out uh, to the muscles, but, but the body is giving sensations to the brain, but something is shifting in the muscles. They might tell the brain that, you know, the muscles are getting tight. Uh, you have to do something, look at this. So no matter what kind of pain that is, it's still sensations coming from the body and up and the, and the brain has to figure out a way to talk to us. Um, when we do the emotional pain, I usually go via the body with a body scanning and um, feel whatever it is and give space for what is through the emotions and that might be connected to something that has happened. So there are memories connected to the, to the emotions and feelings. And there also could be that, you know, in physically pain and muscle pain. Um, the muscle pain we work with through the somatics movements, 
Um, so I kind of have two different ways into their pain, whether it's emotional or physically. But no matter if we do emotional work or physically somatics um, movement, whether it's emotional pain or physically pain, it goes down, it lessens, it reduces or even diminishes or, or disappear. So just by um, going through the body, working via the body, uh, that is the, I think the, um, the missing link for pain relief is to go via the body uh, and do it through movement and also allow um, yourself to sense and feel whatever the body is trying to communicate. So, but if we can know that pain or emotional pain is sensations and we are curious and not judging these sensations and meeting ourselves with kindness and passion, um, I think that is really important as well. Yeah, abs absolutely. You know, we sponsor challenges on this podcast for, and pain works is uh, sponsoring us for this episode. And we have through the year, 10 day challenges and 30 day challenges and 60 day challenges with all kinds of great prizes, everybody training prizes and where you can come up right to where I am to Elk River studios and train with us and masters in several disciplines over a couple of days have a, a retreat experience a multi discipline experience at our somatic fanatic retreats. But there's going to be people that are really used to their trainers telling them they need to strengthen what hurts them and um, that they need to do all kinds of other things. And, and even the idea of trying it for 10 days, why should I bother? I really know my, my, uh, my back hurts. My trainer told me my back is too weak. I have to, I have to strengthen my back, but every time I do, I can barely walk. Um, let's start with the 10 days. Tell somebody that that's, Maybe thinking like, yeah, these prizes are amazing, but do I really want to do this kind of training for 10 days in a row? What can people expect who are in pain right now? Uh, it really depends on what kind of struggle or, or symptoms or uh, problems the person have, because uh, I really don't believe that 10 days would be enough if there is an unregulated nervous system. To regulate the nervous system, we need time. And how much time is, of course, is in, uh, dependent on you know, whatever is in the history. If you want to have something shifting, like um, in the chemistry in the brain, you can have great benefit of doing something for 10 days or 21 days. But if you want to have a transformation and um, creating neuroplasticity, to have a lasting effect of something, you need to do it over a certain amount of time and repeat over and over again daily. Uh, because or else things will go back to what it was like if you just do it for 10 days and then stop. So would you say if people are signing up for a, a, one of the shorter challenges that one of the things they should be searching for, if not you know, the removal of all pain, is in 10 days, there, there must be some small victories toward what I would think is deciding I want to do this a lot more than 10 days. Um, what are the subtle little things people talk about? They feel differences from the very first lesson. So if I agree with you that doing a 10 day challenge is not going to solve anyone's problems any more than taking 10 violin lessons is going to wind you up on stage at Carnegie Hall. We are all we're learning how to play the, the most amazing instrument ever known, the human body. And this is not something that you do in 10 days. Um, but in 10 days, I think you can get enough under your belt to decide, you know what, I think I might cut some time out of my weekly schedule to do this permanently, to make a, a practice out. There, I think there will, will be many benefits of doing um, daily practices over 10 days. Mm -hmm. um, and also maybe feel more freedom in the body and um, feel more joy and happiness. This is what actually what I hear all the time that people feel more happy after they have done the somatics. So, and I think that what is important is people choose something that feels right for them. If they want to have something that is regulating the nervous system, uh, they might will do 
movement that is slow so that they can connect between the body and the mind from a conscious part by doing things slowly. And that will, will of course be, be uh, great when they're going to work as well, because you know their, their minds are more clear. Um, they're more kind of uh, conscious of um, how their body is responding to stress and, uh, and in, in relations and, and to their thoughts and to their emotions. So actually it's a total shift when they've been doing this for some time. Yeah. What are the kind of experiences you had a year into your training when so many, uh, so many paths to get out of your pain, you got met with a brick wall and then you were so motivated. You started reaching inside and training your nervous system instead. So I don't know. I don't think we talked about the full uh, time frame of from when you got hit to when you were out of the wheelchair, but why don't you walk us through that a bit from when you really started somatics what was it like a year later and two years later? Because your example is extreme. So I would say for a lot of people with, with less extreme examples, this will, this will be great information to hear what your experience was. So having both chronic fatigue and also chronic pain, uh, I was living with a lots of fear. So my nervous system was in survival mode all the time. I was afraid to move. I was afraid to do th something that will, you know, um, get me into more fatigue um, so I have all these limited beliefs, what I could and couldn't do. And I was afraid of um, doing some movements because I might hurt myself uh, even more. So to have the knowledge uh, about the nervous system and the knowledge about trauma and also using my body as a client, you know, myself as a client and I explore myself and um, that I could do it in my pace and I could do micro movements because I had to stay in the level of safety uh, in the beginning. Uh, when I came over to England, I was still in burnout and I still had lots of pain. So when I had done the morning classes in somatics, I was laying there um, on the floor with a bucket in, in next to me because I was so sick. I felt so nausea, uh, not nauseous. Mm -hmm. I was not having nausea yeah. because there was so much you know, coming up um, from the, the, the traumas. Uh, and for the next module, just after four months, I believe, my energy was starting to, to lift and the pain was reduced and I had got much more freedom, uh, both in my body and also in my life, actually. So just one year in the program, uh, I think I was a totally different person. And also because going out of pain, um, I had to shift the, my mindset because I was all the time busy thinking about the pain, um, thinking that would never go away. What if it's always gonna be like this? Who am I now? What am I gonna do? So, I, you know, this took up my, my space in my brain all the time. So to have this focus and dedicate myself in this, this study, this education, learning, using my brain, using my body, I think that that was a huge transformation, both emotionally, mentally, and physically, and also spiritually, because I got back my, my hope, my belief. I was trusting myself and my body. Um, I knew I could help myself. I um, befriended my body again, because I'd been angry at it all the time. So I think this actually made me as a much better person. And that, that is... That is so hopeful to so many people that are in a lot of trouble and you know, right, how they felt. And um, it's inspiring and touching to me to hear your story. Sorry, you had to go through so much. I, a, a friend of mine also in New York was hit by a taxi and put through the window of a store and uh almost died from blood loss, but then when she didn't was smashed in the pelvis and the legs um, had a very similar multi-year um, and has some permanent levels of disability. It, it, it's subtle. You wouldn't notice it, but uh, went through the same kind of multi-year climb back up from these same questions of who am I now? What is my life going to be? Am I trapped in this? Is my body now a cage that I'm trapped in? And um, it, it's, for those of us yeah. who are lucky enough to not be in this cataclysmic 
trauma situation. It, it, it's unimaginable um, that um, very lonely and frightening place. And to have hope that this smallest and easiest and safest of movements is actually a capacity we all hold to climb one step at a time out of that hole. And it, and it already is within us. You mentioned earlier how so many people go to practitioners when they're in pain who are going to do something to them or give them something that the a chemical will do it to you, or I'm going to do it to you. And to find that the, in many, many cases, in the vast majority of cases, enticing the nervous system to do all the work. Yeah. We all have this natural capacity. Every squiggling critter on this planet has this natural capacity. And it's all based, everybody, on on two things. Every discipline we're talking about, every somatic discipline under the sun is based on two things, moving in slow motion and taking turns of where you're paying attention to the feeling, the physical feeling of it. Uh, like Sol said earlier, even if it's emotional pain, drawing your attention to like, it feels like an emotional feeling, but if you, and we're usually so caught up in the emotions of it, we, we stop and don't recognize that actually there's a physical signature of contraction of muscles that feels like jealousy. There's a, and yours is not quite the same as mine, but we come to feel that pattern. And there's another pattern of what it feels like when I'm scared that I'm next to the edge of a cliff. And there's another pattern that feels like anger or outrage or, you know, um, all these various things or, or love or anything that there's this physical signature of patterns of contracting our muscles that we come to, what we said, we, we recognize it emotionally. Oh, to, to feel jealous feels like this. And we're thinking when we say that sentence that we're talking about emotionally what it feels like, but it's half emotion and half this physical signature that in total adds up to us feeling jealousy or feeling outrage or whatever we're feeling. And until you do these exercises that really kind of try to help you separate out this, there's an emotional thing happening and there's a physical thing happening. Draw your attention to the physical part. Um, it's amazing how quickly just drawing your nervous system and conscious mind to that reality pushing it so it's advertised to them starts we we all see people who start you know this, this chunks of tension start leaving them and some who have cathartic episodes will start shaking very hard and uh, almost be reliving moments of this trauma crying or laughing or it's hard to predict but very uh, an outburst of some kind of even irrational type emotions as this memory and, and body memory, there's a lot of work in Dr. Peter Levine's work about this and whole disciplines like somatic experiencing. But even when you're just working physically, these, these cathartic episodes, as I call them, can occur where someone is back to a moment of trauma and emotionally ready to deal with it and feel it in their body. And it's amazing what happens as they excise this physical tension being held on there's this simultaneous psychological and physical ease. Every time you have a cathartic episode, um, as, as Colonel Ryabko, uh, the Grand Master of Sistema said, we, we do a very intense form of body work with tools that, that do this. And, and when someone had a cathartic episode, he said, you know, Dan, you could go to a psychiatrist for psychologist for a few years and, and talk and finally get to the point where you were ready to really look at that past trauma. And the same thing would happen to you that just happened to him. You would shake, you would cry, and you would release both the emotional content and the physical content out of your body simultaneously. Our technique in the soldierly way is to kind of back flush that through physical sensation. But you can go either way to excise this trauma. We talk a lot about pain and a lot about how it sticks around. And I try to remind people that um, anytime you've had major injury, the, the uh, soft tissue around that injury is gonna stay very hard a long time. Uh, I think nature would prefer you miserable and alive than too relaxed and dead. So nature is perfectly willing to leave you miserable and alive. But nature also provides this mechanism where you can slowly 
talk down that excess tension that's protecting this wounded part of you and let the nervous system know one step at a time that that trauma is over, you're healed, and you're ready to relax and get back to it. And it's an amazing thing. It's a hopeful thing. And we're about to do some free training to, to just give you the smallest little taste to hopefully uh, just eke your curiosity about what might be possible in you right this minute to move in slow motion, move your attention around under the direction of someone who knows from experience, who knows what you've been through, if not worse, who's been there and use these very same techniques to just one step at a time, walk herself back to normal function, to a vibrant, meaningful life, uh, to a happiness and a hopefulness that could seem very, very far away from where you are right now. So tell us all a little bit about what are we going to do today? What, what are the broad strokes of the lesson? Uh, is there anything people need to set up, especially people in pain? How should they get themselves ready to do this lesson with you? And what kind of parts of the body are you going to focus on? And just give us a little bit of what's about to happen for everyone. Yeah, I'd love to. Uh, first of all, you need a yoga mat because we're going to be on the floor and have some comfortable clothes. So this is what you need and also some space if you can. Uh, there are lots of movements and exercises we can do sitting in the chair, but I'm going to start teaching movements on the floor. So you have to be able to come down to the floor. And what we're going to start with is actually a body scanning to just come into the body out of the head so that we can start to relax the nervous system by focusing on what you feel and sense in the body. So it's the soma, what you can sense and feel within you. And then we're going to do a um, couple of movements that are further back, actually, to reduce the tensions in the small of the back. So we're going to do some small movements with uh, using the pelvis, just tilting the pelvis, uh, using the back muscles and also the belly. So because when the back and the belly are being in the technique as we do in somatics, we are creating slow contraction and shortening the muscles and then slowly releasing the muscles and then relaxing. Then the muscles will relax more and they will become longer, have a more uh, normal resting length and it, this will increase and um, uh, also help you to reduce the pain and stiffness in the body so get yourself ready i'm going to wrap the episode up uh saul thank you so much for your generous sharing of your story and this free lesson that you're about to provide everybody i'm going to wrap this episode up what i want you to do is go into the description and click this link and take saul's free lesson right now this is a rare opportunity for such a high level instructor to be giving you a lesson absolutely free don't walk away don't wait click the button and do it, do the training, feel the benefit, reduce your pain, and I'll see you next time right here on Somatic Fanatic. Mm -hmm.